Mike? Uh, thank you. Good afternoon. If we could ask everyone to uh, to take their seats, and we'll we'll move along. Um, I'm Michael Green from CSIS and Georgetown University, and it's my pleasure to introduce our our luncheon speaker. And I'll also be uh, moderating the session that follows with a panel of distinguished uh, Singaporean and American strategic thinkers. Um, Chiwi Kyung is the second permanent secretary in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Republic of Singapore. He previously served as the director of the division responsible for security and intelligence, and he before that had a career in the Singapore Air Force <coughs> in um, air uh, defense artillery, uh, was trained in that and in command and staff here in the United States at Maxwell Air Force Base. Yep, a good, good Alabama, Singapore weather. Um, you're lucky they didn't send you to Alaska or someplace. Um, the remarks by um, Secretary, uh, 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 Secretary Chiwi Kyung will be on the record. Um, the questions and answers will be on the record. When we shift into the panel discussion, we'll go into our um, Chatham House rules. Welcome and thank you for joining us. I saw Admiral Blair. Um, just now, I thought I'd do a confession that we were fellow intelligence chief in a respected country for several years and recovery and recovery <laughs> intelligence chief. And, and, and the relationship between our two countries uh, are indeed a very strong one. And, and, and I think both of us can attest to that, that, <coughs> that both in the uh, former and as well as through the security intelligence channel, we, we work closely together. Um, we spend many evenings and mornings uh, making assessment for our respective prime ministers and, and, and president and wondering what should keep them awake in the night. <clears throat> so very quickly, I, I, I did some assessment for this talk. And I say it's, it's, it's not in a very good situation. Firstly, you're talking during lunch. Um, secondly, um, you're the permanent secretary to the foreign minister, so everything that needs to be said must have been spoken. Uh, so the situation is not very good. But I quickly make another assessment <clears throat> that we have <clears throat> three ministers lining up, and there's a lunch in between. So you need to find a diplomat to, to fill up the in-between during lunchtime. Uh, so I'm not going to spend too much time um, uh, talking because, uh, as I say, uh, all the good points, the, the punchy uh, issue have all been stated by my foreign minister. Uh, but Secretary Clinton uh, wrote in the November foreign policy that the key driver for global politics in the coming decades will be the Asia-Pacific and and I fully concur with that assessment that indeed this will be an Asia-Pacific century. Uh, my minister have uh, spoken about the economic realities, how the world's fastest and largest growing economies uh, in Asia, uh, about how the potential economic potential have shifted to the East. Uh, but there's also the reality that more than half of the world population live in Asia, and Asia is also home to established and rising military powers. Spending on military capacity have increased steadily uh, because as countries look towards a whole myriad of security challenges that they have to face. However, the narrative of uh, Asia-Pacific century is still a story that is unfolding. While Asia is the most dynamic region in the world, there remains much to be uncertain about. With the rapid growth, new points of strategic tensions and conflict will emerge as states seek to secure access to sea lanes, energy resources, pursue their trade and economic interests. This could lead to flexing of newfound military powers to also to placate their increasingly nationalistic and also increasingly confident population. 
In Asia, the US-China relationship will continue to dictate the complexion of developments in the region. <laughs> Potential flashpoints like the South China Sea, East China Sea, Korean Peninsula cannot but reflect the larger geopolitics in play. Currently, the predominant thinking in the region is that it does not see a zero-sum game between US and China. Asia, Asians believe that it's big enough, Asia is big enough to accommodate both a rising China and the US. Most Asian countries also believe that the US continued benign presence and engagement with China can make China a more responsible and international citizen with a positive stakeholder for the region. And that can provide space for smaller countries like Singapore. In Asia itself, there is the recent global development have continually to remind Asians that we live in an increasingly interconnected world. <clears throat> the 2008 financial crisis are still very much in the mind of Asian countries. They realized that stuttering recoveries elsewhere in the global economy will ripple outward and affect Asia, perhaps even with the threat of financial contagion. Even what happened in the Middle East, the Arab Spring, has an impact on the psyche of Asian countries. Partly because most Asian countries or many Asian countries are still very much dependent on Middle Eastern oil. And also, Asia is the home to the largest Muslim population. <clears throat> Another factor is also the usage of social media as well as the demise of long entrenched dominant political regime in the Middle East has weighed heavily in the calculation of many Asian governments and their concern about domestic stability. Amidst all this uncertain environment, um, Asian countries know that they are facing increasingly multifaceted, complex, and rapidly evolving challenges. These challenges is transnational and respect no international boundary. They include issues like food security, energy security, pandemic, proliferation of weapons of mass destruction, just to name a few. It's well recognized that these challenges are too large for any country to tackle alone. Mindset that disregard whole of government thinking or partnership with civil and private sector or partnership with extra-regional country will quick become obsolete. As the strategic uncertainty become the new norm for Asia, Asian countries recognize the need for security partnership that extend well beyond traditional defense partnership. This afternoon, I would like to touch, touch on three aspects of it. The first one is a regional architecture that is centered around ASEAN. ASEAN has developed several regional architectures to maintain regional stability and prosperity in East Asia through the engagement of key stakeholders both in and outside the region. This include the ASEAN Plus One, ASEAN Plus Three, the ASEAN Defense Ministerial Meeting Plus, the ASEAN Regional Forum, and the East Asia Summit. These frameworks form a mosaic of multiple overlapping structure with ASEAN at the center. They have developed organically in response to different needs at different times. On the first look, it may appear untidy, but each structure plays its own unique role and complement the others in reflecting the, region's, the region's diversity. In an increasingly brittle international environment, having such overlapping architecture will make the regional framework more robust in our view and able to withstand shocks. While aimed at different purposes, these fora are all anchored on some fundamental principle, common fundamental principle, like building trust through open and inclusive dialogue, commitment to cooperation and collaboration, and respect for international norm and international law. Large multilateral fora such as the ARF, the East Asia Summit, the ADMM Plus, comprise a broad and inclusive framework, also to encourage cooperation on concrete initiatives both within the region and the extra-regional country. Let me just touch on the EAS. 
The EAS is now more significant given the formal entry of the US along with Russia. US participation will contribute to a more robust and resilient regional architecture, which will in turn promote regional stability and economic prosperity. It will also enrich the discussion on strategic issue, even as the EAS country continue to focus on strengthening functional areas, pursue ASEAN connectivity, and even pursue some economic cooperation. There's the talk about having a comprehensive uh, economic partnership for East Asia. Currently, the East Asia Country Summit, the EAS, has identified five priority areas for functional cooperation, namely finance, education, energy, disaster management, as well as avian flu prevention. And the EAS members' focus today is to put meat on the bones in these functional areas so that EAS can bring tangible benefit to both member states as well as their people. The second aspect of security partnership that I want to touch on is the 1.5, the track 1.5 meetings that, that is uh, happening within the region. And one of the most um, dominant and well-known one is the Shangri-La Dialogue that is organized by IISS. The Shangri-La Dialogue has helped to foster a norm of dialogue, of, a norm of dialogue. The broadening scope of participants in the recent 2011 meeting have some 31 ministers defence ministers and vice ministers in attendance, uh, together with many intelligence chiefs uh, at the dialogue itself. And it served to a very important platform. It's almost inconceivable that, that you can bring some of this intelligence chief or defence minister to be at the same table. So this PREC 1.5 meeting at the Shanghai Dialogue have helped to float many ideas and put many issues that are otherwise not possible to be put at the table itself. The third aspect, besides having a formal architecture center around ASEAN, having a track 1.5, is the development of operational cooperation. And this is vital as we talk about security partnership within Asia itself. One of these groupings that we can touch on is the Malacca Strait Patrol that have helped to build regional security and enhance trust between maritime forces and navies in the region itself. Malaysia, Indonesia, Thailand, Singapore have banded together to coll collaborate on our counter-piracy effort via both the Malacca Strait Sea Patrol and the Eye in the Sky Air Patrol. By the way, the Eye in the Sky Air Patrol was first seeded during the Shangri-La Dialogue through a Trap 1.5 of dialogue. Uh, this effort, I would say, have been successful in reducing incidents in the piracy within the Strait of Malacca and Singapore itself. Not only that, the three littoral states, Singapore, Malaysia, Indonesia, have also worked along with IMO to develop cooperative mechanisms to engage extra-regional stakeholders to drive concrete operation, operational cooperation on navigation safety as well as environment protection for the state. Such cooperative mechanism has provided a focal point for us to bring in key user states like the US, Japan, China, Republic of Korea, and India so that resources can be put together to contribute and expertise can be put together for various projects. Another example of such possibility of successful operational cooperation is the Regional Cooperation Agreement on combating piracy and armed robbery against ships in Asia, what we call RECAP, which is also an open and inclusive platform for governments to share and analyze data on piracy and armed robbery within the Asian region itself. The RECAP Information Sharing Center, which is established in Singapore in 2006, has also helped for countries, is manned by, I think I was told, some 50. Uh, national from, from 15 different places uh, to enhance maritime domain awareness in, in the Asian region. And it's now sharing a successful model and expertise with even littoral state of the Somali Basin region. What I'm trying to drive at is that the principle of shared effort and inclusive cooperation that's behind this 
operational cooperation will transfer well to the region's effort in tackling future more sensitive security challenges. Uh, example could be terror network. In sum, the three aspects of having a formal regional architecture, having 1.5 <coughs> dialogue, as well as tangible operational cooperation will help stakeholders both within the region and outside the region to communicate and to cooperate together. In the remaining time before we go into the Q&A, let me talk a little bit about the role of the US. In this overarching regional architecture, all countries desire to deepen understanding and for mutual cooperation. Both major regional and extra-regional power have the necessary roles to play, as do smallest countries like Singapore. Singapore has been a consistent and reliable partner of the US because we believe that the US has played and will continue to play a vital role in maintaining Asia's stability and prosperity. Just to sidetrack for my, my script, I think the fact that the US have been a benign force that have promoted stability and prosperity over many decades is a very strategic asset of the United States. It's something that I think has been underestimated. Most countries are fearful of emerging and big powers, but the fact that the United States have been there for many decades since the World War and have played a benign role and bringing stability and prosperity have created a strategic asset that I think many policymakers should take that into serious consideration. Singapore welcomes the significant strike that has been made over the course of the Obama administration in engaging the region. U.S.-ASEAN relations have grown since U.S. accession to the Treaty of Amity and Cooperation in Southeast Asia in 2009. Annual U.S. ASEAN leaders' meeting have been convened for the last three years, and we recognize this as a strong signal of U.S. attention to our region. During the most recent ASEAN-U.S. leaders' meeting held in November 2011, the leaders adopted the ASEAN-U.S. Plan of Action for 2011 to 2015 as an updated framework for cooperation. The U.S. also announced its representative to the ASEAN-U.S. Eminent Persons Group and launched several initiatives on ASEAN connectivity, maritime security, food security, youth program, and education in ASEAN. These are all very positive indications of U.S. interest in the region. President Obama's visit to Asia for the EAS last November after the successful APEC meeting in Honolulu was also the culmination of the past three years of renewed U.S. engagement with ASEAN. President Obama's announcement of the U.S. commitment to be here to stay was positive and well-received across the region as far as our assessment goes. The continued constructive presence of the U.S. is, a wel is welcome in the region where dynamism and growth are taking place. Yet, despite the many high-level visits and substantive initiatives that the U.S. is undertaking with countries in the region, the increasingly partisan mood in Congress and the many difficulties that the U.S. economy faces are also not far in the mind of some Asian observers who will consider the sustainability of the U.S. engagement. The focus on traditional military corporations have appeared to be the key outcome of the visits in November, including the U.S. Rotation, Marine, rotation of Marines in Darwin and the step out of defense engagement with Philippines. In view with, of this, Singapore being a, a friend of U.S. have urged the administration and, and friends and partners that it's important for the U.S. to continue to project a coherent and sustained policy of engagement towards Asia. The U.S. can build on the past four years of engagement to broaden and deepen its cooperation with treaty allies, new partners, as well as regional institutions, especially ASEAN. I think my minister have spoken quite a bit of that, and I think that was his key message uh, during this trip to U.S. Of course, the U.S. continues to play an active role in the ADMM Plus 
and have provided strategic balance in the regional security ar architecture. And we in Singapore welcome the US to continue to do that. As well as we also would like to welcome Secretary Benita, uh, my fellow intelligence chief in my previous life, that he will pick up Secretary Gates' tradition of attending every Shangri-La dialogue during his time in office. This year will mark the 35th year of ASEAN-US relations. ASEAN is working towards its integration and community building target by 2015. It has a population of roughly 600 million, economy about roughly US 1.5 trillion. Therefore, ASEAN has the potential to be one of the world's most dynamic region and we believe that the U.S. have plenty of scope to play a significant role in promoting this ASEAN growth. <coughs> ASEAN is also where we believe the contest of idea between major powers will play out most intensely in the coming years. Therefore, we believe that it's important that the U.S. remain deeply involved in the region, commit enough uh, knowledge asset as well as enough uh, capital, personnel capital in this region, not just strategically, but also economically and in the people-to-people -people sector. We believe that this is the way to build up a holistic uh, US engagement and soft power asset within the region itself. In this regard, beside, apart from President Obama taking part in the summit, strategic discussion in the ES, we have welcomed the US comprehensive engagement of Asia, including in functional areas of cooperation like health, education, humanitarian assistance, and disaster relief. Singapore also believes that we can cooperate closely with the US through the US-Singapore third country training program. We believe that this is a strategic move, not only to help to address the developmental gap and needs of the countries in the region, but also to build up the trust and the, the sense of uh, mutual cooperation within the region. So I'm going to stop here and uh, I'll take whatever questions you have. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Ikong. That was comprehensive and strategic and exactly um, the right way to start our session. Uh, briefly, uh, abusing the prerogative of the chair, um, I'd, I'd like to uh, pick up on one thing you noted, um, partisanship in the United States. Um, I'm not going to deny that's a problem. But one thing I, I hope our friends from Singapore will detect in this conference and in your time here is how bipartisan Asia policy is in this town. Um, it is simply not uh, conceivable to me that the next administration, even if parties change, would do anything different in terms of the trajectory of expanding engagement um, the way we have over the previous three administrations, really. And if you don't believe me, the best place to look is American public opinion polls, where for the first time in decades, Americans by a wide margin now say Asia is the most important region to us. And we're not just talking people in California or Hawaii. We're talking people all across this, this diverse country. Um, now, resources, uh, other things we'll have a big debate about. And that, you know, if I were in Singapore, I suppose I would watch a little nervously. But the direction, the trajectory and direction, I think, has a lot of bipartisan support. Could I ask, you gave a fantastic, uh, in fact, the best um, uh, taxonomy and, and, and uh, an assessment of the architecture in the region I've heard in some time. Typically, when we have conferences on Asian security in, in Washington, we start with our allies. And then we kind of work our way, and at the end, we talk about EAS and regional architecture. And typically, in Singapore, it's the reverse. So I wonder if you could take just a minute or two and, and, and tell us how you see the state of and the relevance of America's alliances, bilateral alliances in Asia, to the architecture you're describing. As, as I say, I think the, the, the key asset that the US has, that you have decades of uh, evidence to show a, a global power uh, that has enormous capabilities, but yet have used those capabilities and asset in a benign way to create stability and, and peace that the countries in the region can prosper. I think, I think that, that, that particular asset is, is, is strategic and I think it should be used carefully. I, I think um, <clears throat> whether is it 
allies or, or, or partners that you have in Asia, my own sense is that they all welcome the U.S. continued presence. I think, in fact, um, I think my minister hinted a bit to that, that, that we don't quite like the word pivot uh, because we think that uh, we should have this concept that it has always a continued presence. And, and, and it has proven itself to, to be a great assets in, in the region that have allowed the, the countries in the region to, to prosper and to, to grow in a, in, a, in a manner that respect international norm and international law. So I, I, I don't see a big uh, difference in that. Thank you. I have a feeling this pivot word, especially on the next panel, is going to be pummeled and hammered and hit through the heart with a stake. Um, and then it will bounce up again tomorrow. Um, the floor is open. Uh, so we'd uh, entertain your questions. Just raise your hand. We have microphones. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Samira Daniels, uh, Ramsey Decisions. Um, a couple of times uh, the uh, term pluralism has uh, come up. And I, I would like to know specifically um, whether Singapore and perhaps other c uh, countries in Asia have a role in, um, you know, uh, improving relationships among Muslims, uh, Hindus, uh, uh, Christians, and so forth. I think that is a, a th that in in Asia, any country that can um, uh, corner the market on that is doing the region a great favor. So. Uh, I, I think in, in, a, in a sense, uh, Asian countries or ASEAN countries have um, uh, tried to play that role. I, I mean, um, Malaysia recently just have a, a global conference on moderates uh, where they try to promote uh, moderates and thinking even though it's, it's a country that is, um, that is a predominantly a Muslim country. So, uh, so there, there are possibilities, uh, but of course each country will have to do it within the constraint of their own domestic politics. Thank you. Other questions for the Secretary? Let me then um, bookend uh, by asking the final question uh, as well, if I might. Um, again, going back to your description of architecture, one of the as other aspects of architecture, which is a misleading word because these things aren't really based on intelligent design, they sort of grow yeah. organically, but one of the other features now is this growth of minilateral uh, groupings from the Shanghai Cooperation Organization to the U.S.-Japan Korea trilaterals, U.S.-Japan-India now. You didn't mention that, but it's becoming an important feature of the landscape. Um, do you see that as a positive development, potentially uh, fraught with uh, danger? I think the, the reason why I have focused on the, the ASEAN-centric uh, architecture is I think uh, speakers before that have alluded to that, that when you have major powers and major shifting powers, uh, you require, I think Charlotte uh, alluded to that, you, you, you require a third uh, a leg that has allowed this, whereas you, you, when you look at the the Shanghai Cooperation Organization and so forth. It does not provide that, mm -hmm. that form of uh, fundamental, uh, fundamentals that allow a regional architecture to, to develop. So today, the ASEAN-centric one, uh, the, particularly the EAS, where you have also major extra-regional power like the US, the Russian, the Chinese, uh, is a architecture that I see that have the greatest potential to, to, to develop. Uh, Wee Kyung, thank you. Um, let us uh, all publicly thank you, and then we'll take a brief moment to invite the uh, rest of the panelists up on the stage. Thank you very much. <laughs>